live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering VMworld 2017. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem partners. Hey, we're here live, the Cube coverage at VMworld 2017. Behind us is the floor in the VM Village. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, our next two guests, Beth Phelan, who's the President and General Manager of Data Protection Division at Dell EMC, and Yang Bing Lee, who's the Senior Vice President, General Manager of Storage and Availability, VMware, vSAN, all the greatness. Welcome back to the Cube, great to see you guys. Yeah, great to, to be here. You. Get the heavy hitters here, data protection, AWS, a lot of great relationships, synergies happening. Yeah. Give us the update. Yeah, well, oh, go we ahead, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> we've been working together for a long time, yes. but recently we've really amped it up to the next level. Um, great, great discussions around enabling data protection for vSAN, and then as announced this week, um, you know, would Dell EMC be the first vendor to have data protection for VMware Cloud on AWS? So it's a really exciting time to be here, and I've been in, in this business for a long time. This is the best VM world that I've seen so far, and so it's just really great to be here with Yan Bing. It's been very cohesive. I want to just stay on that for a second. This is a big milestone for VMware it is. to have this shipping of the general availability of AWS, especially with on the heels of the vCloud Air and all that controversy. Andy Jassy's on stage from Amazon Web Services, yeah. really kind of looking right at the audience and saying, we got your back, this is yeah. a real deal, and the bridge to the future's there. I'm paraphrasing, he didn't say those exact yeah, yeah, words. Yeah. Yeah. How do you get that data protection? Because that data protection in the cloud is hard. Yeah, well the nice thing is that since we've got all of our data protection running in a cloud environment now, we could then use that to build the connections with VMC. So we have Data Domain Virtual Edition running, we have Data Protection Suite running in the cloud, so people can use the same technology they used on-prem, but now in AWS in conjunction with, with VMC. So you kind of have hyper-converged infrastructure means, meets cloud data protection. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yan Bing, what is the difference, I mean, what's the requirement of hyper-converged infrastructure data protection? How does it differ from traditional storage and how is it evolving? Uh, great question, you know, uh, Bass and I, we've known each other for quite a few years. I have to say our relationship hasn't been, you know, this close, uh, it's, and it's getting closer and closer. So coming back to your question in terms of uh, hyper-converged infrastructure, you know, we're seeing two uh, fundamental shifts around data protection. One is, the blurring of the boundary between backup and DR, and these two really coming together as unified data protection. I think there has been a lot of discussion around this for a long time. But this become even more compelling, now we talk about hyper-converged infrastructure, where you know, our customers, they so enjoy the benefit of having compute and storage uh, you know, combined together in a common management experience, and they're looking for the same for data protection. So we're really seeing customers want to see data protection as a feature of hyperconverged, as a capability as that's part of that rather than yet another silo they have to uh, manage separately. You know, they want policy that manage storage, compute, and, uh, and backup and DR all together. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why you know, that's really drive our partnership yeah, yeah. Uh, so much closer. You know, it's interesting. Many of the clients that we've worked with over the years, mm -hmm. they'll have a backup strategy, but they don't really have a DR strategy, and they sleep with one eye open at night. Mm -hmm. And they're afraid to go to the board because it's so expensive, it's expensive insurance, and so you're seeing that they're, it sounds like they're blending those two together, kind of killing mm -hmm. two birds with one stone. Mm -hmm. um, are there trade-offs or things that customers should think about in, in, in that regard? How do they sort of go from where they are today, which is sort of a backup bolt-on to that integrated DR and backup? I think part of the key is the technology that we're leveraging now, and we leverage something that has like CDP, continuous data protection. You can use that one to have a data path to the secondary storage, and you can use that same code to also initiate um, disaster recovery with near zero RPO and RTO. So another thing that we announced this week is with our DPS for apps next edition, that we now have hypervisor direct backup. And what that means is that we're integrated directly with the ESX and we are leveraging um, protect point for VMs to move data to data domain. That same technology is also leveraged within recover point for VMs. And so you can see the engine, the internal engine of the data movement can be applied both to disaster recovery and to backup with different windows of RTO and RPO. I'm glad you said near zero RPO because there's no yeah. such thing as zero RPO. Yeah, but yeah. you're, but yeah. you're seeing uh, more pressure 
to, to get as close to zero as possible. What's, what's driving that, that pressure and how are you meeting it? Well, I think with all of us, we know that in the industry, customers are expecting 24 by, you know, 24 by seven uptime, right? So they have many, many applications that they need to have the confidence that if it does go down for any reason, they're going to be able to bring it back up within minutes or hours, not days. So it's really the drive for continuous availability, um, you know, getting as close to that as possible. Yeah, the other factor there, if I may, one more, John, is the, the, the challenge in, in data protection has always been, it's, it's, it's largely been a one size fits all, and it's either, I have, I'm either underprotected or I'm spending and breaking the bank. Mm. So are you able to, through your technology and, and process improvements, improve the level of granularity for different workloads that require different service levels? Mm -hmm. Um, two things come to mind with that. One, we're seeing more and more interest in customers integrating data protection directly with their applications, whether it be SQL or Oracle and, or, or the VM itself. Yeah. So that's one thing. So we can custom the data protection to a particular application. And then on the second piece of that is with the different interfaces that VMware offers, we're able to do either VADP level integration or more fine-grained integration like we're doing with the Protect Point for VMs. So we are getting to the point that we can make different choices, either application specific or something that is fine-tuned yeah. based on the, the level of mission critical mm -hmm. um, capabilities that the application requires. I want to get you guys' perspective, just a high level, holistic view for a second. Mm -hmm. We're seeing the convergence of the two worlds, the cloud native world that they have no walls, they have no perimeters, they operate in a mindset of there's a security holes everywhere and, this is how they, and their protection's hard, they think of it differently. Yeah. On-prem, the traditional methods, how are those coming together? Because you have customers that want <laughs> run VMware and do stuff with data protection yeah. and they want to now run VMware in the cloud. What's different? What do customers need to know that are we on either side of that equation? If I'm on the on-prem and I now want to use VMware in the cloud on AWS, mm. how does data protection fit in that? Is it the same? Is there tweaks? How mm. do they think about it? Do you want to answer that? Or? Yeah, so uh, in terms of on-prem or uh, VMware in AWS, so, you know, a big value prop is really the consistency in operating model. I'm sure you have yeah. heard about this a million times. Yeah. Uh, this Talking about it all week. The, yeah. uh, yeah. Uh, all week long. Yeah. And so, uh, uh, so, so from data protection, we're trying to do exactly the same. So for example, VMware Cloud on AWS, the very first data protection that we certify on that platform is from uh, best organization, is Avamar Networker being the first set of solution uh, certified. And our customers definitely love the continuity of, I already have the experience and licensing associated with my on-prem um, protection solution and they want to carry that forward into so the So same cloud. operating model, so from the customer's yeah. perspective, mm -hmm. I've been doing it this way exactly, with yeah. VMware mm -hmm. and Dell Data Protection, mm -hmm. Dell now it's the same in the cloud. No yeah. change in... Yeah. yeah, I mean I think that's really the beauty of it. Even with, with DDVE, I mean you can have replications, so you can do through different, you know you can have replication in the cloud as well as another level of protection of your, of your secondary storage. Yeah. Um, I think some of the changes probably not necessarily, uh, yeah, so operating model consistency, you know, we, uh, Dave, we touch upon, you know, hyperconvergence is driving a lot of functionality uh, into a single control plane as opposed to these different silos. And, you know, we would like to see that happen uh, in the cloud uh, as well. And along that line, you know, best organization and my organization are really looking at, you know, how we build the best next generation integrated technology that truly leverages the, the strengths of both organizations. That's simple and easy to use. <laughs> yes, yeah, and, and, it and it's got to be easy to use. Yeah. Yeah. Simple, easy to use, policy-based, yeah. um, you know, turnkey uh, solution. So, so this is uh, you know, what we're doing, uh, something pretty innovative by truly bringing our engineering together um, and, and trying to build our next generation this solution. This is the synergies that Michael was talking about. When we interviewed Michael yesterday, right. he's like, look at the synergies are well beyond his expectations. Mm -hmm. This is, seems to be flowing nicely in the, in the culture. Mm -hmm. and he, when EMC had the federation, there was always kind of like an interesting thing, but now things are flowing differently. It seems to be smoother. You guys hey, have a reaction to that? To I totally agree with what you said. Yeah. I mean, it, it feels different. And I think as we go forward, we have even more opportunities. But we're not even a year into it, and there is a distinct difference in terms of 
recognition around the joint opportunity and like yeah. you said, the smoothness of the conversation I think is It's clear, is really it's clear, helpful. there's clarity. Yeah. But also, you know, yeah, the rising yeah. tide floats all boats and hey, VMware stock is going yeah. like this. Yeah, it makes it's us got all a nice happy. slope to it. Yeah. <laughs> so I definitely want to echo Beth on that and you know, the type of collaboration we're seeing between our two organizations, you know, uh, my BU is actually having multiple touch point into uh, Dell and Dell EMC organization, whether it's our VxRail and uh, uh, you know, the vSAN based collaboration or the data protection angle. And we're really seeing that uh, happen across different functions. So we are starting from go to market collaboration, you know, how we uh, provide the best set of solution to our customers in joint go to market effort. You know, vSAN, is gaining a lot of footprint in mission critical workload, yeah. and a critical requirement is data protection. So, yeah. so we're doing a lot of joint solution, joint setting together. And really the next step is that joint engineering effort leveraging the best of both worlds to build next generation products that's optimized for hyper-converged, that's optimized for for the software defined data centers, yeah. yeah. So if I dial back a decade, let's say, as, as virtualization generally and VMware specifically saw its ascendancy, data protection totally changed mm. for a number of reasons. You had less physical resources, but backup was still a very resource intensive application, and so things, I mean, that's really where Avamar came mm -hmm. to fore, is mm -hmm. we could dedupe at the source and all that mm -hmm. other cool stuff. You walk the floor, backup data protection is exploding again. It's like yes. the hottest area. Yes. So yeah. two questions, two part question. Why is that? And then how does Dell EMC, with you know, its large portfolio, its big install base, how do you maintain competitiveness with all that new emerging innovation? Let me start with you. Yeah, man. well, I think the first question, and I want to hear your answer too, but what I would say is, you know, because the industry is changing so dramatically, it's requiring data protection to change just as dramatically. Right. Right, and so that is a lot of people are seeing opportunity there. Whereas maybe, you know, I've had people say, you know, well you don't really have to protect data in the cloud, it's all somehow <laughs> magically protected. I've had customers say that to me, and I think that we're now beyond that, right? And people are realizing, wow, there's a you know just as much of a need or more of a need than there was before. So I think there's plenty of you know companies appreciate opportunity mm -hmm. and they see opportunity right now as data protection um, evolves quickly to address the new IT world that we live in. Anything you would add to the first answer? Yeah, so I, I think, you know, several years ago, VMworld feels like a storage show. You know, I, I think it's, you know, so there's still a lot of exciting, interesting storage company, but there has been quite a bit of uh, consolidation. You know, you know, you know software-defined storage, it seems like that market landscape is becoming clearer and clearer. And we're definitely seeing that spreading into second storage. It's now ripe for uh, disruption. And, and we're also seeing uh, that disruption around secondary storage is also impacting data protection software. You know, it's not just the yeah. secondary uh, storage element, but you know, extend to the entire uh, software stack. I think it's very exciting, and also thinking about, you know, what is going to be the economical benefit of uh, of, cl uh, of cloud, and how do we take best advantage of that? And this is why with our you know a AWS relationship, you know, we are rejuvenizing our DR effort, you know, we have successful on-prem product like SRM, uh, but we're seeing tremendous new opportunity to look at that in the context of, of cloud, truly leveraging the economy and scale of what cloud has to offer. So lots of driving factors to, it's now a cloud to really revitalize really And you have no, cl and you have no mm. cloud, it's a cloud yeah. show, mm. and you have no cloud. Yeah. Okay, so Beth, second part of my question is, yeah. how do you keep pace? I mean, there's some pretty tremendous yeah. innovations going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you keep pace? What are your thoughts on, on yeah. all that? Yeah, yeah. So the really cool thing is, because we're, you know, we're Dell Technologies, um, we have not only data protection assets, we also have servers, we also have um, switchers, we have everything we need to build a full integrated stack, which we now have with IDPA. So with the integrated data protection appliance, we have the, the best of data domain, we have the best of our software, we are leveraging also power edge servers and Dell EMC switches. So we have everything that we need to build that end-to-end -end best in class integrated appliance. And as customers change how they consume data protection to more like a converged uh, consumption model or a hyper-converged consumption model, we have all the pieces that we need to make that a reality and then to, to continue to move forward. So when you combine that with our relationship with VMware, and the ability that we have to drive innovation jointly, I have no doubt that we're going to be really moving ahead into you know, modern data protection. 
Final question before we wrap, R&D comes up, Michael also mentioned, and so did Pat, billions of dollars now in R&D, free cash flows of a billion dollars, three billion for VMware. A lot of um, observations this week that we kind of look for and, kinda, and read the tea leaves. One of them was, at least for me, was the stack a collision between hardware and software stacks. Mm. As IoT and servers and devices, you have hardware stacks and software stacks. Untested scenarios, certainly in vSAN, you're seeing a lot of activity around untested new use cases. Yeah. Mm. And so it's going to put pressure on engineering. So the question is, what's the vision for the R&D for you guys around data protection? Because it's not just data protection anymore, it's a fundamental linchpin mm. in the equation of cloud. Yeah. Thoughts on engineering road, yeah. I mean engineering R&D. So one thing we're doing actually right now this week is we're restructuring our um, EMC um, lab, Dell EMC lab back in Hopkinton to move to more of an open, shared, pivotal type environment. Yeah. So you know it's clear that as we go forward, doing things like peer programming, um, test-driven development, you know, enabling continuous, um, always good known state. Like there are definitely advancements happening yeah. in software development that are accelerating innovation. And so as we take advantage of that, that's how we keep pace with what's going on around us. Because you're and right, the, the number of things to get involved in is endless. I just want to point out before we end the segment, uh, you guys are very inspirational. Women in tech, I think you guys are amazing. We talked about the engineering you, uh, resources. Your thoughts on the industry, obviously a lot of controversy <laughs> in Silicon Valley and around the world around STEM and women in tech. Mm -hmm. Thoughts that you'd like to share to all the, the men watching and all the folks <laughs> and young girls who want inspiration. Any, any. You guys certainly, uh, you know, it's yeah, passionate I'll for start. us. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, first of all, I want to thank theCUBE for having such awareness uh, in this topic and, you know, constantly featuring uh, women in tech on your shows. You guys have been doing a great job raising the visibility of thank women you. leaders Thanks. in the industry. Thank you. So uh, certainly this is a topic very uh, dear and near uh, to my heart. You know, this week, you know, we can still see uh, not only our employee base, but our customer base is heavily men uh, dominated, uh, but I think we're seeing unprecedented levels of awareness and attention to this topic in Silicon Valley and uh, across the world. Yeah. Really, I, I do think we are starting to see much better transparency in metric. We're seeing increased uh, accountability in uh, business uh, and business leadership. So I think those, and we're seeing a lot of social awareness. I think those are going to drive uh, positive change. So let me give you a concrete example of, uh, for example, things we do in VMR. We just gone through uh, bonus allocation and uh, compensation adjustment. I would get a report from HR comparing the percentage of what we have done for the men population and women population. And so you get real time feedback in data. And when we see the data, it's actually quite shocking. Oftenly, we do see, oh, unconsciously, you know, we may be allocating those Unconscious things. Unconscious bias, uh, yeah, if you will. Yeah, those differently. But uh, because of those real time data and feedback, we are getting able to you know, keep ourselves accountable. So, so just, you know, this is no longer just talk. This is real data you know, in real HR practice that we are already building into our day-to-day -day practice. So I think I'm very optimistic. This will take time, but this is, you know, we're moving in the right direction. It's a historical moment yeah. in, in the world if you think about it. This is super important time. Yeah. The inspiration and also the young women out there too, and also for the men. They need yeah. to kind yeah. of be aware as well, because inclusion includes not just women, it's everyone, and that seems to Absolutely. be the, the, in fact the trend, we had an interview on theCUBE, and uh, Anar Simpson, uh, who works for Mozilla, and she's mm -hmm. doing some work um, for um, Tech Nation, um, she said they're changing it from diversity and inclusion to inclusion and diversity, uh -huh. they're flipping it around yeah, where yeah. inclusion nice. leads diversity, because yeah. they want to lead with the message of inclusion yeah. as a primary mm -hmm. message yeah. with diversity. So it's not just a diversity message, it's inclusion. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. And the only thing I would add would be, you know, the phrase, um, you know, she can be it if she sees it. I think having people like myself and Yan Bing be visible role models, yeah. it's very impactful, especially for young women, to see, you know, women in tech leadership positions. Uh, it's hard to imagine yourself in a role if you don't see anyone similar to you in a role. So I think the more that people like, like us and our peers get out there and really put an effort into, um, being visible and, and you know. Do you see the networks forming more? I mean, is there more action flowing happening? Can you compare and contrast just even a few years ago? Is it on the rise significantly? I, I think it's on the rise. Yeah, yeah, I do get asked to be involved in a lot of opportunity yeah. in situations, yeah. And, and of course your Twitter handle puts it right out there. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
at, at YV High Heels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, you're not shy about it. And right, the, the, yeah, there's nothing shy about it. I, I realize, you know, Bess and I, we are both dressed in very <laughs> feminine way. Um, I do think... Your capability the, is off the chart. You're a great, impressive you know, the executive. The society is increasingly more inclusive about their notions of a female tech leader. It's, it's not just one size fit all. Yep. I think it's encouraging us to show who we really are, yeah. the authentic self. And uh, I think that's very important for young girls to see. Because I remember when I was a young girl, I didn't go into tech expecting I do not get to be who I am. So, so yeah. yeah, and that shouldn't... Uh, reflect your capability of any way, any kind. And that seemed to be great awareness, the Google memo that went around, and it's all over SiliconANGLE, some great videos on SiliconANGLE on that topic. And again, you guys are great inspiration. We love working with you, you guys are great executives. Hey, thank you it's for bringing the topic content. up, it's important. And, and you're welcome. we're certainly yeah, passionate yeah. about it. We'll be yeah. at Grace Hopper as well for our fourth year. We do that Fantastic. show every year, we're learning more and more. And we're going to do a podcast uh, for guys too, on the SiliconANGLE. Nice. Because a lot of guys want to know what idea. to do. So okay, that's great. Inclusion and diversity, of course, it's on, I need the help. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante here, live at VMworld. More coverage coming after this short break.